All right, yeah, thanks so much for the introduction, Matt. Thank you all for uh, being here. So um, as you introduced, I'm Alp. Uh, I'm the chief scientist at Ferro Labs. We build uh, industrial machine learning software. Um, I'm also an adjunct faculty in uh, computer science at Columbia, so I appreciate the kind of technically minded people to uh, feel free to voice their questions. Uh, it's very uh, exciting. So today I'd like to kind of make sense of the artificial intelligence hype. Uh, there's a lot of excitement around AI. And I want to highlight kind of three specific properties of AI and machine learning solutions that we found to be really critical for the industrial sector. So there's great momentum in AI. Uh, the last decade has kind of you know, given rise to the renewal of interest in neural networks. Um, we've seen applications of neural networks and neural network-based technologies in a variety of fields. These have been fueled by uh, incredible advances in GPU computation, as well as a fantastic movement in the open source community uh, to build many frameworks, so many that I can't even list them uh, off the top of my head, but TensorFlow, PyTorch, and so many more. And these have really made a huge impact in the technology sector. Uh, I would say the you know big players, the Googles, the Facebooks, the Ubers have really capitalized on this technology. Um, also, quantitative finance has also been uh, tracking this very closely. But uh, what about the industrial sector? This is a, a huge area that is very interested in these developments in artificial intelligence. And what do they have to say? So to, I'd like to paint a picture of how industrial process improvement uh, look, looks like today. So I visited a, a steel factory uh, last year. It's a pretty large factory. It has about $4 billion in revenue. And the problem that they had was they want to reduce faulty steel production. So they have a part of their factory where they're producing these massive coils of steel, and they want to effectively minimize scrap rate, the, the product that they produce that they can't sell to the customer, immediately at least. So this is a massive kind of part of the factory with incredible machinery, and there are actually 12,000 sensors already built into this kind of part of the factory. However, uh, of these 12,000, about 200 of these sensors are stored, and these are typically the things that they get to kind of adjust. So like parameters and configuration knobs, uh, the temperature at certain parts of the process, how much force is being applied to the steel, you know, a variety of different configurations. And traditional kind of lean manufacturing and Six Sigma techniques, which are the kind of bread and butter of industrial process improvement today, are based on the idea of kind of a design of experiments. So someone with domain expertise, uh, an expert in the factory will kind of hand pick maybe five things to look at and they will use their kind of classical statistical methods to try to identify whether those factors impact the quality of their product. Right. So if we were to put this into a picture, it looks like this. A domain expert identifies a few factors. Uh, they gather data for analysis. If you're lucky, those five factors are in the 200 that they stored. If not, they have to actually configure things and wait for some amount of time to measure that data. And then they apply a traditional Six Sigma technique. So for the technically minded out there, these are things like linear regression, logistic regression, things like that. But we have all this observational data. You know, the 12,000 sensors, you know, 12,000 configurations, measurements, everything is just sitting there. And we are actually, we have the capabilities of storing this, not a large amount of data. And this is perfect for kind of machine learning and AI. This is the type of data that we apply AI algorithms to. So let's go ahead and use the latest and greatest of AI technology. So we learned three lessons in trying to do that. The first is that interpretability matters a lot. So when we think of uh, cases where artificial intelligence has made a huge impact, they are oftentimes in situations where you can't change the inputs. So here I'm showing a array of handwritten digits. And on the left-hand side, if you squint your eyes, you'll see that those are eights. And on the right-hand side, these are threes. Okay. So this is a typical type of data set that we would plug into an AI algorithm to be able to classify, for instance, people writing letters or numbers in this case, and actually putting a numerical label of eight and three. And so the United States Postal Office uses algorithms like these to be able to root your letters, no matter how you write them. And what they care about is, regardless of how you write an eight or a three, is just classifying eight, classifying eight and three correctly. They can't change how Americans are going to write eight and three, right? That's an impossible task. So they only care about predicting eight and three. Now in the industrial sector, we found that they really care about 
changing their inputs. Right? We have found them to ask for models that are open, models that show the relationships between the things that they can change, the inputs to our analyses, and the outputs that we get from our machine learning and AI models. So we need to be interpretable. So when a factory is thinking about how to design their next batch of kind of steel coils, they need to understand, well, what happens when I change inputs one, two, and three, and four in this specific way? And moreover, can I understand how the interrelation between input one and input three really affect my output? Why is this one thing so nonlinear, whereas this other thing is really linear? So we appeal to these kind of white box methods that really explain what's going on underneath the hood. So factories have superb domain experts. These are people who've been, you know, specially focused on manufacturing a certain product for years, and we really should be complementing their knowledge rather than trying to throw black boxes at them. So when our customers come to us and say, we want an AI solution, they find the off-the-shelf neural network and kind of typical AI approaches to be too much of a black box. So what we've been focusing much more now is on building interpretable machine learning models that are based on these white box models. That we don't shy away from cracking open the algorithms and showing the relationships that we find and the patterns to our customers. All right, the second lesson is, lesson is that customization matters a lot. So AI works great when we really don't have a very fine-tuned understanding of how to model the thing we care about. So I have three examples here where AI works fantastic. So let's say you're an advertisement company and you want to be able to model users clicking on articles or advertisements that you're showing on your product. So we really don't know how to model complex people, you know, interacting with links and clicking on things on your websites, all right? Let's say you're a social network and you want to be able to recognize faces in your images. Well, we also, we really don't know how to model two-dimensional images of three-dimensional faces and doing that accurately. We don't actually use the physics of what's going on to generate an image to describe what's going on. And let's say you're a media company or a video company, let's say, and we really don't know how to model people consuming media if you want to recommend the next clip for someone to watch or the next movie for someone to watch. So in situations like these, and especially in the technology sector, if we have a massive amount of data, we can throw this data at an artificial intelligence kind of model, and we can do really well. And this has been kind of the main kind of engine that has led to the incredible advances in these three areas, for instance, in the last decade. Now in the industrial sector, we found that our customers are looking for bespoke models. They really want their models to be tailored to the problems that they're trying to solve, and there are oftentimes many constraints that their analyses need to conform to. There are hierarchies involved that they really know how things kind of come together in their factory. There is a sequence of events. They might want to model kind of the inter-arrival of certain things. They might want to test specific hypotheses. These are all topics that industrial people know, but they simply don't have the computer science or statistics know-how to be able to go out and kind of implement the solution from scratch. So Faro kind of operates as a compiler, allowing domain experts to be able to express their expertise in models so that we can build customized solutions for specific use cases. So again, we find our customers who are basically working in these complex engineered systems. They know a lot about what they're trying to do with machine learning, and we try to adapt to each factory. So when they go looking for an artificial intelligence solution, the one size fits all isn't too appealing to them. They want kind of bespoke solutions. So we do this by offering them a tool that allows them to custom compile models that suit their actual needs. The last lesson, which is arguably the most important, is that statistics matters a lot. Now, statistics isn't a very exciting term. A lot of people kind of nod off or they remember their college days and you know, it's very boring, but it's actually very, very important, especially in, this, in the industrial sector. So the cost of making a mistake due to a bad prediction from an AI or machine learning algorithm is huge. Now, if you're in the social network setting, you have a social network company, and you pick an irrelevant article or a bad um, advertisement to show, and the user doesn't click it, your cost is in the cents. Okay? So let's say you're a media company, and you recommend a really boring movie, 
and you just decide that that user is just going to drop subscription, you know, we can measure that in the order of 100, okay, hundreds of dollars. A factory that fails to prevent a, predict, a preventable machine failure, so the machine learning algorithm said no failure, and there was a machine failure, and a production line stopped for 10 minutes. That's in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. Okay? So they really need to be able to understand when a machine learning prediction is actually confident, when it actually makes sense. And this is the realm of statistics. Right? So we need our machine learning models to be honest. They need to be able to tell the users when it's confident, when it knows what it's doing, and when it thinks that there's just garbage coming out, and therefore garbage is coming out. It needs to provide statistical guarantees and needs to be safe. Right? So here is an actual example that we have, an output from our system, where one of our customers wants to be able to predict this time series. So everything we have at the left of the bar is past data, and everything to the uh, right is future data. I'm just plotting it so that we have a comparison. So the Faro machine learning prediction at every time point comes with a confidence interval. So that blue band that you see is a 90% confidence interval. It says that 90% of the time, our predictions are gonna fall within that. And you can see that the further out we predict, the larger that band becomes, which is reasonable because the uncertainty grows as we're predicting many, many days into the future. Now, if you compare that to a classical technique, here we have robust linear regression. This is well inside of the Six Sigma kind of toolkit. The main thing to notice here is that regardless of whether this is a good or bad prediction, it's just a single number. It, there is no notion of uncertainty. And of course, you can see that here our customers have used the bespoke nature of our product to be able to account for certain factors that allow for this very dynamic prediction into the future where the time series drops and rises again. So we find that factories have excellent current practices. They've been building whatever, they've been manufacturing whatever they're manufacturing for years. So machine learning and AI simply augments them. It empowers them to change their behavior, to improve their operations. But if, they, if we give them a bad prediction, they can simply fall back to their current practices. They're already really good at what they do. So they really need to know when to trust predictions. So when we go and you know, look at AI solutions, these AI solutions are too focused on prediction. They're simply predicting, is it an eight? Is it a three? Are you gonna like this movie? Are you gonna click on this ad? That's it, they don't care about the consequences. So safe machine learning, we build all of our machine learning models based on statistical models. Therefore, we're able to report all of our confidences throughout the entire process. So the meta lesson that we learned throughout this is that to create value for our customers, we need to change their behavior. We need to change the way in which they actually operate within the factory. And to do that, we must empower them. So Faro is an industrial machine learning software package that empowers our customers to build these interpretable, bespoke, and space, uh, safe models to solve specific problems that they care about. So here are some few examples that our customers are doing today. So one of our customers is maximizing the uptime of their factory by predicting these machine failures. So we actually give a probability distribution of this machine is gonna fail, and this is how confident we are that's gonna fail. So they can actually change the way in which they act. Are they gonna preventively do something, or are they just simply gonna you know, observe it and be on high alert? They can minimize faults in the product that they're producing by discovering new product configurations. We have white box models. You change input one and four in a way that you've never done before, and they find that, oh, hey, we can solve this quality issue that we were having, let's give this thing a run. And finally, they can reduce accidents by forecasting personal trends. They can actually change the way in which they do adaptive safety planning to be able to reduce the number of accidents occurring over the next weeks. So these are a few of the examples that we are able to kind of um, show where our customers have gained a new ability using Faro to build machine learning um, solutions for their problems. Thank you for listening. I'm happy to take Great, questions. Great, very cool. Uh, thank you very much. How do you... Um,
What happens upstream? How do you get the data to feed the systems? That seems to be one of the big issues with industrial. Is it lots, lots of different machines and hard to get the data, data out? So, so we've been actually pleasantly surprised. A lot of factories are uh, much ahead ahead of the curve than we thought they would be. Um, they have internal databases where they are storing a lot of data. The 12,000 to 200 is one of the examples, uh, but they were very quick to go up and start uh, you know, keeping thousands of other sensors in their internal system. So oftentimes they already have the data that allows us to build these kind of initial experiences where they can try things out with the data that they have. The next step, of course, is then linking the live data. And there it's a little bit more of an interaction with their IT folks and then talking to our cloud platform. Thank you. Um, so we're going to have uh, this uh, yellow thingy that we throw around, which actually is a microphone, <laughs> as demonstrated by Diego. Uh, if anyone has a question, uh, while you think about the question, how, so um, the industrial world is quite wide, and um, I would assume that they I don't know, a car manufacturing company is very different from you know, other parts of the industrial world. Uh, is that one size fits all? At the end of the day, is that all statistics for you? You mentioned expertise. Um, how do you build ex vertical expertise into this? Uh, that's a great question. So we're exploring a variety of verticals, but the main expertise comes from the customer using the product. So we kind of, through various wizards and various kind of interactions, allow our users to basically express the things that they know about their process in building the machine learning model. So we don't have to become experts in any specific vertical. What we need to understand are the common types of uh, constraints and common types of domain expertise that our customers want to be able to express in their analyses, be it from auto or metals or any other vertical. Yeah, that's a really good question. Yeah. Good. Do we have any? Um, if not, uh, tell us about the company. Maybe I think you guys are the are at the. Um, the new lab, right? Is that correct? That's a great. So we're part of the new lab community, uh, but we're not physically based there. We're actually down in Soho. Okay. Uh, but new lab has been fantastic for us. It's a, for those of you who don't know, it's a community of, of, of startups that are kind of focused on a few areas. Um, robotics being one of them, AI being another, uh, manufacturing. It's this space that has huge studios, uh, shared 3D printers, uh, machine shops. So it's a fantastic group of people that really kind of like to share lessons and, and learn from each other. And there are a few great companies there that we interact with. Catching it is half the battle. <laughs> you mentioned that there was some resistance to the newer networks because they're not transparent. Right. Can you talk about that a little bit and then how your newer models um, in terms of accuracy compare? Yeah, that's a great question. So oftentimes, uh, so, okay, so the interpretability of neural networks is, is, is really kind of a, a tough topic, you know? So we have some ways of, of trying to identify, you know, specific patterns once we've trained a neural network, but oftentimes it's very difficult to make sense of how the inputs affect the outputs. That's right. So uh, accuracy is not something that uh, our customers care too much because anything that comes close to a neural network in terms of accuracy that is interpretable is exponentially more valuable to them than a neural network that predicts 2% better than what we do because they don't care about the prediction. They care about being able to understand what's going on, take those patterns, and being able to uh, impose their knowledge into the discovery of those patterns, right? If a neural network discovers that a particular configuration of chemicals in making steel is going to give you amazing steel, but that configuration of chemicals is not physically possible, like there's an actual physical constraint, uh, let's say you can't put 120% of something into something, right? You know, um, these are issues, right? They, then they just start losing trust in what the machine learning algorithm can do, what the AI system can do, and they really fall into this notion that if we do pipe garbage in, it's always going to just give garbage out. Therefore, even if we're not piping garbage in, how can I trust the result? Yeah. Yeah. That's a great question. Yeah. Thanks. Great, one last question over there. Behind you. Nice. So, thank you, I come from an industrial background myself, and what I'm wondering, especially if you've shied away from neural nets, is a lot of sensors come in like every millisecond or something, 
but you might only have a bar of steel rolling off the line every 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. So now you have thousands and thousands of every one of these sensors. Are you, how are you dealing with the differences in time series? Yeah, that, that's a great question. So um, we do our best to be able to extract meaningful features. Uh, we do this by a combination of kind of automated techniques, but also the, our users have the ability to kind of influence, like if they know that certain features of these time series are gonna be important for them. Again, because they have you know, 30, 40 years, even not more of like looking at this data, right? They know it intimately well. Um, so there is some first step of dimensionality reduction. The key thing is once we do that kind of feature extra extraction, everything that we build on top of that is statistical and based on kind of these bespoke models. And there we have all these things like the confidence intervals and the distributions and things like that. Yeah, that's a great question. Very good. On this note, thank you very right. much. Thank appreciate you. It. Yeah, appreciate it. Thank you.